Next on the delegation, the freshman. It's an honor and a privilege to hold this office. Representatives Denny Heck, Susan Del Bene, and Derek Kilmer tell what it's like being a rookie in Congress. It is strange joining an organization that, as you've seen in recent polls, is held in lower regard than head lice and colonoscopies. What's working and what's not? Part of the challenge we face is we need leadership to allow us to work together and allow us to work in a bipartisan way and allow us to vote on issues. And the challenges of trying to get things done in the other Washington. A good chunk of folks who are there to gum up the works. We've got to get back to a functioning Congress. The freshmen, next on The Delegation. Local production and broadcast of The Delegation was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Evans School of Public Affairs at the University of Washington, leading the field in public policy and management education, research, and service for over 50 years, and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you. From Washington State to Washington, D.C., they are the women and men you elected to represent us all in Congress. This is the delegation. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we appreciate the fact that uh, you're taking the time out of your busy schedules here to make it. But I wonder this, you're, uh, you're going into that second year of uh, your time in office as Congress, in Congress. Do you still feel like newbies? You're looking at me, but I'm going to defer to Congresswoman Delbaney, who was sworn in two months, three months before us. That's right. I'm the senior, senior one of right. the group yeah. um, since yeah. I came in on the lame duck session at the end of, um, of 2012. So, um, but I think we all probably, now that we've been serving for a while, probably feel like we are definitely participants in the process, are very engaged on issues, and there was a large freshman class. So. Um, you know, we represent a, a big part of this Congress and the opportunity to get things on a better path. So I don't, I don't feel super new anymore, and I don't know how you guys feel. But, but you have the chicken, and tell us about the chicken. Yes. Uh, indeed. Uh, the most junior member of the Washington delegation is, uh, is gifted with a, um, uh, a really ugly painting of a chicken, <laughs> which now hangs in my office, So, uh, uh, which I will gleefully give to Congressman Heck at the end of this year. Why, why will you do that? You're, you're <laughs> less junior than I am. Uh, why are you going to do by that? By the alphabet, right? Yeah, by yeah. the alphabet. That's by how the they alphabet, measure it. It's yours, Congressman Gilmer. Unfortunately, I am the most junior member, according to the alphabet. <laughs> yeah. do, you have, do you have the smallest office? Um, the, the, uh, I do. Uh, the, the office uh, uh, distribution process works first by seniority and then by a lottery. And um, I had about as much success in the office lottery as I had in the Powerball. I, uh, of the 435 members of Congress, I drew the 429th uh, office, uh, which um, came with the broom. Um, <laughs> and several mice, actually. Okay, okay, so. okay. I have to tell the story because I, I sat that. next to it. Yeah. There are 70 of us drawing by lottery. And the whole time, he's wringing his hand saying, 70, I'm going to draw number 66. I'm going to draw number 66. And to make a long story short, he walked up there and drew number 65. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a win. I mean, that's a win. <laughs> Don't you have a bit of history? Because Henry Jackson. I Yeah, I have a great office, actually. I'm, first of all, I'm just happy to have an office. but. Uh, I also have the office that was uh, Scoop Jackson's freshman office, too. All right. Let's talk about uh, serving, but also the public's perception of Congress <laughs> these days, yeah. which you know is not good. I mean, the polls show that Congress is not uh, respected. And uh, that was even before you guys got there. Yeah. And we, in the wake of the shutdown, the government shutdown, it only got worse. What did you hear from your constituents when you were coming home during the shutdown period, when you could get away to come sure. home, because I think people are angry. People are justifiably angry. And, you know, I, I think all three of us spent the last year with people, by and large, asking, uh, dear God, why would you want to be in Congress there when it's such a mess back there? And I think I and I think both of my colleagues here have generally responded the same thing, which is it's because it's a mess back there. We actually want to be part of fixing it. You know, there's, uh, it, it is strange joining an organization that as you've seen in recent polls, is held in lower regard than head lice and colonoscopies. Um, and I think, <laughs> That's the, bad. I, I think the shutdown was a pretty...
prime indication of why that is so. Extremely damaging. I mean, in my district, the largest employer is the federal government, and you saw a tremendous impact, dislocation from federal workers, social services that uh, were very necessary, but that were set aside during the shutdown. And so uh, people are very justifiably uh, frustrated. <clears throat> As a new representative, uh, I don't find it particularly uh, productive to be frustrated. I'm really motivated to see us get this ship righted. This is the time where it's really important to serve and really important to help get things on a better track. And um, people are really hoping that we'll work together to come up with solutions. And I think that all of us are focused on solutions to problems and getting results and working across the aisle, whatever it takes to make sure we move things forward. And you know, we just have to keep pushing because I do think that the American people, our constituents, but across the country are frustrated and want to see that change. And I believe we'll get there as long as we keep working hard together to make that happen. Representative Heck, what is the biggest surprise, the one thing you didn't know when you were elected that you have learned since you've gone back to Congress? Well, frankly, Joni, I haven't been surprised, too terribly surprised by much of what mm -hmm. I've observed. I mean, we knew it was dysfunctional. And <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. Is it? I, I've been mildly surprised by some things. I've been mildly surprised by the the scale of the institution, 435 members. That's a lot of people. Uh, and I have been discouraged at times by the obsession with spin and messaging. Uh, and, I, and I've been borderline despondent at times about how some people treat other people. Uh, Susan and Derek have talked about how this dysfunctional Congress kind of renews our interest to be engaged. But I think we all believe the same thing. We really only got control over ourselves. And for my point, and I think theirs as well, I have two touchstones. Always look for common ground and always be civil. Those are the two things I can do to bring to this institution that I hope will improve it over time. Yeah, but you know, in these times, those two touchstones rarely seem to happen. At least that's the perception well, among Henry, a lot of people. What? The alternative is to give up on democracy? No, I'm I mean, not saying, but I'm just saying that, you know, obviously, I hope you're successful there. I think most people want that. But the fact is, <clears throat> you know, I think if you look at the way things have been, been transpiring here, particularly with the shutdown, how do you really make that happen? How do you do that mm -hmm. as freshmen? Well, it, it, some of it is how you spend your time and how you approach the job as an individual member. I mean, the vast majority of people I talk to actually don't give a rip about whether we get more Democratic or more Republican or go more to the left or more to the right. They just want us to stop moving backward and start moving forward. And frankly, that's, that's my hope, too, is that we get this country moving forward again. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the, the, um, one of the highlights of my week when I'm back there is I participate in a group that's called the Bipartisan Working Group. And it's a group of Democrats and Republicans who meet for breakfast, usually on Wednesdays. And it's, you know, a group that generally everybody sort of checks their snarky talking points at the door. And we sit around a big table and try to figure out how we work together and how we can solve problems together. And every time I walk out of there, I find myself thinking, well, that, that gives me hope. And, you know, and now there's a couple dozen of us, not a couple hundred of us, but it's a start. And I think that's the kind of thing you're going to need to see if we're going to right the ship. Let's go back to the shutdown and talk about yeah. sort of the feeling that each of you had as that was going on. And do you think another shutdown is likely, Representative Kilmer? Well, it's, you know, it's a fixer-upper back there. It, it, it's, um, it's, it was deeply disappointing to see that happen because where I think all of us come from, rational actors, when acting rationally, choose not to pull the trigger when pointing the gun at their own head. And in this instance, you've seen a cost of the... Uh, to our nation's economy of $24 billion in the midst of a very uh, fragile economic recovery in the first place. I, I sure as heck hope that that doesn't happen again because there was no upside to it at all. I was reflecting, as, as, as my colleagues were talking about, when we went through freshman orientation, they had a guy who walked us through the budget process. And he said, so it was like out of your high school civics class. He said, here's how it works. You know, the House passes a budget. And then the Senate passes a budget, and then they go to conference committee and work out their differences on a budget. And then the House passes spending bills, and the Senate passes spending bills, and then they go to conference committee to work out their differences. And after about 15, 20 minute description, he then said, but that hasn't happened in years. <laughs> and it, to me, it highlights, you know, we've got to get back to a functioning Congress because it creates tremendous uncertainty, not just for federal agencies, but I spent the last decade in economic development. The main thing employers look to from government 
is an environment of trust and predictability, and I think Congress has completely screwed that up. I get a kick to some degree out of those who are always saying, we had to run government more like a business. We had to run government more like a business. And in the businesses that I have been involved in, if you wanted to succeed, there are three things you would not do. You would not trash your own employees, you would not cease operations, and you would not refuse to pay your bills. And that's exactly what was occurring during the shutdown. And I, I think it was a hard lesson learned, and I'm going to choose to be optimistic about January 15th. But it's important that we have leadership, too. I think we know there are many folks on both sides of the aisle that would pass legislation and move issues forward. And you saw that even during the such shutdown. We would have had the government back open again if we were just allowed to vote on a bill to do that. And we weren't allowed to vote. And so part of the challenge we face is we need leadership to allow us to work together and allow us to work in a bipartisan way and allow us to vote on issues. Um, you know, my background is in business and as an entrepreneur, and your job is to make decisions to help move things forward. And the legislative body seems to do everything to avoid making decisions. And yet, if we're going to make decisions, we need the opportunity to put things on the table and let folks vote. And finally, when we got the opportunity to vote, we ended up opening the government back up. But there was no, absolutely no reason we had to wait that long. We could have done it early on and move forward. We have other issues like immigration reform where we need the opportunity to vote um, so that we can move forward. And that's the key thing that needs to change to get us on a great track is that opportunity to, for folks to have their say. Leadership is one thing, ideology also is another, which tends to be a barrier here. How do you get beyond that on both sides of the aisle? Um, not just the Republicans, but also the Democrats, because there's, there's the politics there. What's, what's the way to get over that hump? But once again, if you have the opportunity for people to, to vote on their views, that we bring bills to the floor where people have that chance to have a say, then you're gonna see different views represented. But if ideology prevents any legislation from even having the opportunity to be voted on the floor, then you're not going to get all those other voices to be able to chime in. And I do think that there are many issues. Immigration reform is one. The budget is another um, where if we can get legislation on the floor, you're going to see people on both sides of the aisle support it and we'll be able to move forward. And that was true even with the Violence Against Women Act. The right bill came to the floor. It passed with bipartisan support, but it was stalled for so long because people wouldn't let that legislation get voted on. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And then, you know, there's the, I'll give you the bad news and I'll give you the good news. I mean, the bad news is, as you've seen, there's a good chunk of folks who are there to gum up the works. You know, I, I went out to dinner with three Democrats and three Republicans one night. And about 45 minutes into the meal, I said, you know, it seems like we ought to be able to get our stuff together and actually start getting some stuff done. And the guy across the table from me was a new member from the Midwest, a Republican. And he said, Derek, I like you. And he said, but here's what you need to understand. He said, I won my seat by defeating a Republican incumbent by running against him as not being conservative enough. He said, my first vote was a vote against John Boehner for speaker. And I sent out a press release saying I voted against him because he's too compromising. He said, I like you, but I have very little political upside in compromising with you or any other Democrat. And I walked out of there and I called my wife and I said, I have two reactions to this. One, how incredibly forthcoming. And two, oh my God, right? Because we're in trouble if that's, the, if, that's, if that's the approach. Now, the good news is this. I think that's a minority viewpoint. I think the majority of people in our Congress actually want to see us move the country forward are not interested in defining success as making the other party look stupid, but rather in defining success as what is in the interest of our country. Now, we need to see our Congress as an institution overcome that, uh, that first dynamic, get beyond the partisanship and actually start focusing on progress. I just want to reinforce what Susan said. Uh, I don't recall the vote in the Violence Against Women Act, but it was huge. Yeah. Reopening up the federal government was almost 300 votes. And Susan's much closer to it than I am, but I would confidently predict that there would be approximately 300 votes for comprehensive immigration reform, too. The votes are there to do a lot of good things that will move this economy forward, grow jobs, and increase our gross domestic product growth rate. Talk a bit about the transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, you run for office, you get elected. I mean, running for office enough is, is that's, that's daunting especially all those fun debates you have to do. Uh, you get Including elected. Including in this that's room. Right, that's right, yeah. We, we did a few with you, all of you. Um, but then you have to travel 
several thousand miles away. You have young children. I do. Um, talk about that transition and how you make that work um, and your life. You know, th that's uh, actually gone probably better than expected in many respects. The, you know, most often we get asked about the travel, you know, when we're with constituents. And, and, you know, by the end of the flight, you're ready to get off the plane. But for me, it's five hours of an uninterrupted work time. That part's fine. Um, you know, part of the reason I chose to do this was because I've got two little kids, and I, and I genuinely care about what kind of country they grow up in. It does mean the nature of our interaction is a little bit different. On, on nights when I'm back in D.C., it means we're talking to each other over an iPad, you know, using FaceTime, which with a four-year-old and a seven-year-old can be a little bit funny. It usually <laughs> involves my seven-year-old talking to me for about 30 seconds, then putting me down on a table and walking away. But, um, <laughs> Wait until they get older. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They won't talk to you at all. That's, uh, I hear it's very similar, actually. You were so. just yeah. getting warmed up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, but but um, they understand why, why their dad's doing this. And for you, the transition, actually, you spent a lot of time working in business. I, and I traveled a lot for work in the past, so the travel wasn't as surprising to me. Um, it, it's a little bit easier. We're, we're in the same country, same currency, and um, I have an apartment there, so you're not dragging stuff, a lot of stuff back and forth, so that makes it a lot easier. But my kids are older, my son's in college, so I would be spending time talking to him on Skype anyway, even if I were still here. <laughs> and my family's here, though. This is my home. And I come home every weekend. Um, we're on the plane together frequently. And, um, and so we go back to work, but then we come back home. And, um, and that's part of the job we're doing. But it's great to have well, that. Speaking of older, home. Daddy Heck. Um, <laughs> was, I could have missed that Cheap one. Shot. Yeah. Cheap <laughs> shot. Cheap <laughs> shot. Um, you mentioned the fact that you know, you've been married a long time. You're very close with your wife and that. Uh, but suddenly, this is a whole different situation. Yeah, you're, you're traveling to DC and having that separation, and at the same time trying to adapt to really is a new gig. My son moved back there for the first six months, and then he decided he didn't want a permanent or even long-term future in DC. That was pretty painful. The first quarter was painful, just getting used to living apart from Paula, and then then my son Bob moved home, and that was frankly kind of a tough transition. But you know, we do. We're, we come home every weekend, and I look forward to coming home every weekend. We work as well, meeting with constituents, but, you know, it's just something you get used to, and you know it ahead of time, so it's not like you have any legitimate reason for complaining about it, so I won't. Do you feel pressure to support the Democratic Party and the president and, and his positions because you're Democrats and that you, you need to do that because it's part of politics. Well, if the three of us feel that pressure, we're certainly disappointing some people because <laughs> you got three pretty independent people here. Uh, we, we have uh, voted our districts and our consciences on uh, oft occasions. I think that's right. I mean, the, the, uh, when I f was first elected to the legislature, there was a guy who used to represent my area named Tom Swayze. Uh, who he, he and I were in Rotary together, and he gave me two pieces of advice when I got elected. He said, a Republican. Right? A Republican. Mm -hmm. Former Speaker. Uh, he said, uh, first, um, on every bill you work on, at least try to work in a bipartisan way. And the second piece of advice, he said, was, um, but what you think is right. He said, there's Democrats with good ideas and some with stupid ideas. There's Republicans with good ideas and some with stupid ideas. Vote for the good ideas, vote against the stupid ideas. Which doesn't sound like rocket science, but is, I think, too often missing from our politics. And that is part of the conversation, and we even have this conversation amongst ourselves when we're talking about issues, is doing what you feel is the right thing to do. Sometimes issues aren't black and white. We have you know, good things in bills and bad things in bills, and they're all put together in a bill, and you've got to piece part it out and make the best decision you can in terms of whether you know, it, there's more good in that bill moving forward or not, or what you can do to continue to work on it um, to make it better. But that is the conversation we have, and that's, the, that's also the job, though, that we each have is to represent our constituents and make that decision. And I think that's something that we all take um, very, very seriously and spend a lot of time um, understanding issues so we can vote in a way that we think um, is most representative of their needs, but also something that we personally feel we can back up. As we get ready to uh, kind of wrap things up here, the fact is, is that unlike your brethren in the Senate, um, you guys have to run every two years. So you get into office, it's almost like you're 
running already. So you're coming into your second year of your Enrique? first term. We have to run every two years? Yeah. yeah. Didn't they tell I'm sorry, you that? did you repeat that? Oh, wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> I want to add something to that. I was on a trip recently with this Brown University political science professor, and she was asked to sort of blue sky uh, what changes she would make in government, and one of her, you know, this could never happen without a constitutional change, of course, was that there be three years for members of Congress. What do you think? <laughs> Well, look, we, we all got elected under the existing rules. Yeah. We knew what they were when they were. That's not the magic wand. That, that's not how I would use my one great wish. Yeah. I would use one, my one great wish to change the way we redistrict. Because that's, even more so than money, that is what has contributed to the polarization. Because you get the circumstance, like Derek was talking about, where people get elected and Republicans are afraid to move to the middle and compromise because they'll get threatened on the right, and the reverse is true as well. And the reason for that is people are gerrymandering congressional districts. And it's a fact, and I know it's a fact, because in 2012, House Democratic candidates received about 1.4 million more votes nationwide than House Republicans. Republicans did a better job of seizing control of certain state legislatures to redraw these lines to their advantage which I hasten to add, Democrats could have done as well had they thought ahead. You know, but I have the, uh, you, you have know, I actually, uh, Senator Slade Gordon w was on the redistricting commission this past time and he said, you know, my district is the most evenly divided district in the country. Um, yeah. It actually is a great thing to be able to have a diverse population of people, a diverse economy, who are all giving you different points of view, giving you feedback, because when I go back to D.C., I already have heard a lot of the, you know, differing arguments on issues, et cetera, and I think you're a better legislator when you have to work with all of that and come up with the best solutions possible. And it's unfortunate when we have districts that aren't as much of, um, you know, aren't as representative of the diversity that, you know, people come up with a little bit more of a, it has to be one way or no way. Um, that's a challenge that we face. It makes it politically more challenging, but I think that, you know, once again, it's our job to continue to earn our job. The one thing I might add, if I could change, um, would be, you know, campaign finance reform. I do think the way, you know, money is involved and how that impacts elections is something that very, very important that we need to um, make sure that we look into. Yeah, this is a job. And, you know, we all sign on to a two-year contract, and then at the end of our two years, the we and the voters get to decide whether our contract is renewed, and I'm fine with that. Um, you know, it, it certainly means that, and the value of that is that we're out in our districts, we're uh, making ourselves available and accountable and accessible to the people who are our bosses. You know, I've done like a dozen town hall meetings. I had, I'm, I'm having three this week. And part of that is one, not just to let folks know what I've been working on, but to hear back from them about what is on their minds and what they care about. I think there is certainly a, uh, a frustration and a concern about the tenor of our politics right now, a sense that things need to work better, and I agree with that. And, and some of that requires actually having Democrats and Republicans talking to each other and interacting with stakeholders regardless of their political stripe or bent. Some of that means dealing with redistricting and structural issues that Danny talked about. Some of that means dealing with campaign finance uh, issues, because I think by November, with the exception of KCTS 9, we're ready to throw our television sets out the window because of all the campaign <laughs> ads. And, and that's a problem, right? I mean, I, I don't think money is speech, and I don't think corporations are people, and I think the Citizens United decision has exacerbated that flood of money, particularly without any sense of where it's coming from or why. Uh, and I think that um, adds to the toxicity of our politics, and that's something that, that ought to change, much more so than the length of my contract. The prospect of throwing my TV out and missing Sherlock just uh, didn't work for it. Didn't work for me. It doesn't work for us. Either. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank the three of you for taking the time to give us some insights into uh, your life in Congress, and uh, we appreciate it very much. Susan Del Bene, Derek Kilmer, Thanks. and Denny Heck. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. As they get adjusted to life inside the Beltway, our freshman members of Congress say it's important to stick together. In fact, Denny Heck and Derek Kilmer are roommates. They say it's like the odd couple. Although they wouldn't tell us who's Oscar and who's Felix. Next time on The Delegation, we're talking with the veterans. Dave Reichert, Jim McDermott, Adam Smith, and Rick Larson. 
have a combined 60 years experience in Congress, but they've never seen it quite this bad before. The Tea Party basically came in and said, we don't care about funding the government, period. There are some in that group who are here to just be disruptive. They don't want to make a first down. Uh, they don't want to make a field goal. They want to throw the ball. There's a frustration about not moving forward, about not getting things done. And, and uh, expressed to me by some of my Republican colleagues. And, and these are folks who are, there to, who are there to try to get things done. But the bunch who are presently paralyzing the actions of the Congress are going to get thrown out in an election. The veterans next time on The Delegation. I'm Enrique Cerna. And I'm Joni Balter. Thanks for joining us. Local production and broadcast of the delegation was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Evans School of Public Affairs at the University of Washington, leading the field in public policy and management education, research, and service for over 50 years, and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you.